Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nate Jaros. I'm the curator of fish and invertebrates here at Aquarium of the Pacific. I'd like to start out by thanking our lecture sponsors, the Gazette Newspaper and the Courtyard Marriott. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of both uh, moderating and contributing to the presentation again, so I'm going to get started. Um, tonight's lecture is entitled The Aquarium's Largest Exhibit, Part 2, Tropical Reef Care and Maintenance. This is the second of a two-part series about our largest exhibit, Tropical Reef. On, nine, on uh, September 16th, some of our animal care professionals shared information about how all the animals are cared for, and tonight we'll be taking a closer look at how this large aquarium works at Aquarium of the Pacific. If you missed the first installment, be sure to go to our website at aquariumofthepacific.org and look in the lecture archive section or on YouTube. Tonight we have a great panel of professionals from our facility uh, representing three different departments. First. Chris Carr, our life support manager, who's worked at the aquarium for over 20 years, will give us an overview on how the engineering and mechanics of the aquarium, including what goes into keeping the water pristine, which uh, contributes heavily to keeping our animals healthy. Then Grady Scallion, our dive safety officer, who's been working with AOP for 12 years, will review the inner workings of our dive program which uh, happens to be the largest in the U.S. as far as zoos and aquariums are concerned. If you tuned in to the first installment, you'll remember assistant curator Janet Monday, who's worked with the aquarium for 11 years, and aquarist two, Lauren Samarov, who's worked with the aquarium for four non-consecutive years. That means she left and came back, so she really must enjoy it here. These great animal care professionals bring experience and perspective from working at the Georgia Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium, respectively. Tonight, they'll give us a glimpse into the complex maintenance and cleaning involved in keeping our largest exhibit looking world class. Take, if you will, the average living room aquarium and imagine that this aquarium spanned three stories, sat in front of an open window, and instead of sprinkling a small amount of flake fluid, you pour 30 pounds of seafood in every day. As you listen to this presentation, look for the similarities and differences between a large public aquarium and your aquarium that you may have at home. For instance, all aquariums, regardless of the size, need a way to circulate, clean, warm or cool, and aerate the water. If you aren't diligent about cleaning, not only does it affect your aquarium's appearance, but it also may affect the health of the animals that live inside. You'll, you may find uh, some of the scaled up versions, the tasks are, are very similar to what you do at home. For instance, just like you, we must uh, vacuum the gravel at the bottom of our aquarium, but when, when we do it, it takes uh, two scuba divers and a one horsepower pump. Just a quick recap, if you watched the first presentation of our tropical reef and soft coral garden habitat, uh, the combination of these two aquariums, which share a common filtration system, is over 360,000 gallons of water, with over representing over a thousand different animals. Uh, it's 28 feet at its deepest, has five distinct viewing windows, and it's carefully designed so that you can't see the other windows from the ones that you're looking in, and the largest one being 44 feet by nine feet tall, and a curved window that, that represents the, uh, the large grand finale. It's modeled after reefs in Palau, which I encourage you to check out the first presentation where we talk about uh, the very specific reefs that the, these uh, aquarium habitats were designed after. And it, again, it takes a great, um, great amount of people, dozens, up to hundreds of including our volunteers to care for our tropical reef habitat. Here's a beautiful overview of our aquarium in the Pacific from the, from the sky. And kind of zooming in, you see underneath these skylights, we have a, the location of our, our habitat where guests uh, can, uh, can view this as they enter the tropical gallery. The tropical gallery is um, kind of designed and built around this large aquarium feature. And thankfully, living in the, the mild climate that we have in Southern California, we are able to keep a large percentage of the filtration outdoors, which Chris Carr will get into great detail about. But you can see the proximity uh, to the tank where most of the filters live. Here's a detailed view of the aquarium with the, uh, the path where our guests walk uh, is highlighted in blue and the aquarium, the large aquariums in white. Uh, guests enter the Tropical Pacific Gallery through here and they, they make their way around um, 
aquarium design is is just really interesting that the, this whole building was literally designed around the build the, the structure of this tank it spans uh, two floors and it's accessed on the the, the third floor um, guests can view the, the through the windows on the second floor and all the different aquarium uh, all the other aquarium exhibits are, are kind of uh, around the perimeter of this tank, making it kind of experiential and um, immersive, um, giving people who never have the opportunity to spend time underwater a chance to look at these animals in very naturalistic habitats. Uh, these aquariums have 18-inch uh, thick concrete walls. Uh, like I say, it's built into the structure of, of the building. The acrylic's approximately four inches thick. Um, and then, like I say, there's a panel that's uh, 44 feet long, which is just incredible to think about um, the scale and the engineering and the design that, that goes into something like this. Um, our dive, we have a, a dive entry point at the top of this exhibit and the place where our divers uh, have their locker room and get ready and all the equipment is stored right above this tank, which is a very convenient for the amount of diving that we do. But without further ado, we've got a lot of people that are joining this panel tonight that are going to come up and talk, and I'd like to uh, welcome Chris Carr, our life support manager, to the lectern. Well, thank you very much, Nate, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Chris Carr. I'm the life support manager here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about what it goes into taking care of the animals behind the scenes, uh, specifically the water. Um, I work at the life support department, and our job ultimately is to make sure the water is uh, optimal for all the animals uh, in, in the aquarium uh, exhibits and especially, uh, trop, uh, especially particularly uh, tropical reef uh, that we'll be talking about today. Uh, what I'm going to go into the beginning is, well, how do we get our water? Uh, well, we're used natural seawater in our exhibits. Um, there's a couple different ways you can get water. You can make it your own by getting uh, tap water and, and adding salt. Uh, in our case, we get real natural raw seawater. Uh, we get it two ways. Uh, one of them is through a seawater intake system that we've uh, designed and built here at the aquarium. Uh, it's actually behind the aquarium uh, off of a short fishing pier. Uh, and you can see the pump down here, and, uh, and this is the fishing pier here. Uh, the pump, we pump uh, about 20% of our incoming water goes, uh, comes from that, that system. Uh, we pump it into our tanks uh, where we can clean it up and, and make it usable for our exhibits. Uh, and then we put it in our reservoir uh, where, we can, where we can use it for all exhibits, including Tropical Reef. Uh, another way we get our water is through seawater deliveries, uh, through a company who pumps natural seawater and, and treats it on site. And then they bring it to us in trucks uh, as needed and supply our reservoirs uh, for the Aquarium of the Pacific. Um, so moving on a little bit about uh, the water and uh, specifically moving the water through the aquarium for the animals, uh, we, we use what we call a life support system. And what a life support system is really, what I say is all of the equipment needed, uh, the pipes and the pumps and all the equipment needed to make sure the water is just right for the animals. Um, in this picture here, it's kind of a lot, but uh, we have a, a graphic from our building, uh, Siemens building technology graphic that we use. Um, and you can see we've got the level of the tanks here. Uh, we've got the pumps here included, the pumps, and then the filters. We've got uh, our heat, our temperature control, and then our disinfection as well. And I can go in through all that with you guys. Uh, and this is just for Tropical Reef. Uh, we have one of these for uh, every single system in the entire aquarium. Uh, but it really does a great job in making the water optimal for our animals. So this is what Tropical Reef uh, life support looks like. Nate gave us a great overhead shot of what it looks like. Um, and you could use, as you could see, uh, it takes up a really large footprint uh, compared to the size of the tank itself. A lot goes into making sure the water is really clean. Um, it was so big I had to go across the street to take a picture of the whole thing uh, there on the right. Now we move into the pumps to start with. This is what moves all the water for the aquarium. Uh, and uh, you can see the pumps here. We've got 12 total pumps for Tropical Reef. Uh, we've got four big ones uh, just to move water through the filters. We have another six uh, just for recirculation of the water. And then uh, we have one for uh, heat exchange for, for controlling the temperature, and we've got another one for ozone. And, uh, and the pumps are really what we use to take care of uh, moving all the water uh, you can see the green part here is the actual the pump itself, and the, the blue area here, that is actually the motor 
that turns the pumps. Uh, and total horsepower of the entire uh, tropical reef system, it's 160, almost 165 horsepower, which is a lot of power needed to move all that water. Um, all the pumps here are fiberglass inside. Uh, everything that touches the water uh, is non-metallic because salt water uh, really rusts everything. So we try to make sure everything is either fiberglass or plastic uh, or something else to make sure that it doesn't uh, break down and rust. And these pumps have to run 24 hours a day. Uh, these animals need 24-hour care. So we need to make sure as a team that we uh, make sure these are not uh, breaking down, they're not turning off, and they're running efficiently at all times. With all our pumps running just for the Tropical Reef exhibit, we're pushing 15,000 gallons a minute. Uh, that's a good amount of water, uh, but that's a good size tank. So we need to make sure that uh, we get good turnover, we get plenty of water through the filters, and make sure it's really cleaned up uh, for our animals. After the pumps, the pumps uh, send that water to the filters. Uh, the water is going through these big vessels here that we can see. And inside uh, those filters are glass, I'm sorry, sand. <laughs> the, the sand inside there is very much like uh, the beach sand that you would see, uh, that you would walk around on. Uh, the only difference is that the sand inside our, inside our filters here are specifically sized uh, to remove a certain amount of particulate size uh, in the filter itself. Uh, what happens is the pumps pump that water across the top, and then it sprays it down onto the bottom, and then the um, the sand mechanically removes all the particles, and then the water comes out of the bottom nice and clean. Um, usually, uh, oh, talking about the sand, we've got about 60 tons of sand. We've got eight sand filters um, in, in, our, in just the tropical reef uh, system, uh, and, and each one uh, contains probably about three quarters full of sand. Uh, so all total is about 60 tons of sand. Uh, they're all running at about 800 gallons a minute. Uh, water, salt water going through those filters, which is a, a good amount of water. Uh, how we get the, the stuff out once we get it trapped in the filters? Well, uh, what we do is we, we turn it around so we send the water through the bottom and it comes out the top and it takes all the bad stuff with it and then it goes down the drain. Uh, we could talk a little bit more about where it goes uh, in a minute. Um, that uh, these consistently need to be cared for and cared for and maintained. Uh, we do that by uh, common inspections, where we do inspections uh, monthly, uh, where we go inside this little manhole cover there, and uh, we peek around. Uh, we can also do sand replacement after a certain amount of time. The sand gets worn down, just like river rocks would in a, in a stream, uh, where we need to remove that sand and, and put in new sand. And then uh, we also stir the sand as well, where we take a big wand and we move it around in there to prevent any clogging or channeling to make sure the filters are running optimally. So one more par portion of our, uh, of our filtration is disinfection. And what we use for Tropical Reef is ozone. Uh, if you're not familiar with what ozone is, uh, oxygen gas is two uh, atoms of, of oxygen. Uh, and ozone is actually three molecules of oxygen. We make ozone here on site, and we can talk a little bit about that before, but we use ozone because it kills the bad stuff in the water. It kills the viruses, the bacteria, the fungus, the molds, and a lot of other things listed. Um, the ozone uh, is very unstable, and it wants to lose that third molecule of oxygen to, well, it readily loses that third molecule of oxygen to uh, animal tissue, so it lyses the cell and ends up, uh, and ends up killing the, the bad things in the water for us. Uh, it also helps with water clarity as well. Um, the way we dose it, and you could think about that is, well, why would we want to put ozone in the tanks? It could harm the fish. Well, we don't put it directly in the tank. Uh, we take some of the water out, and we put it into what we call a contact tower, what you can see over here. And it will go into one side where the ozone will make contact with the water. And that's where all the magic happens, where the ozone hits the water and, and kills all the bad things. And then we have to take that ozone out of the water before it gets back into the tank. So right, right next to it, you'll see they're paired up here. It'll come right down into the next one, and all that ozone will off-gas before that clean water goes back into the system. So this is how we make ozone at the Aquarium Pacific. Uh, we're not able to import it. Ozone does not last very long, so we need to make it and use it immediately here on site. So this is our ozone room. Uh, basically what you need to make ozone is you need a lot of cold, dry sparks, ultimately. 
Uh, if you've ever plugged something into the wall and you saw some smoke come out after a little spark and you smell that little metallic smell, that's exactly what you smell is ozone. And that's really what we're doing here, only in a much larger area. Uh, we've got the air here from the compressors, and it's pushing air, and it's through these filters. Then it goes into our ozone generator, which is really just a lot of sparks. From that point, it goes into our little discharge area where we can, they're called rotometers, and we can send that ozone to any single tank, uh, and uh, depending on how much ozone it needs. This is how we get it into the tank itself. So the ozone will travel through a stainless steel pipe from the ozone room all the way up to Tropical Reef. We can see one of our pumps here. This is the ozone pump. And this is where the, the ozone's coming in from the, tropical, or from the ozone room. And this is where it's becoming injected into the water, where it goes into our ozone tower. Now, before I was showing you guys those ozone towers, and they were very skinny, small little ones. Those were for other tanks. Uh, the one for Tropical Reef, this is actually the ozone tower behind it. It's integrated into the building, and it's about a 12 by 12 foot tower, um, 12 by 12 or wide and long, um, and then it's about 20 feet deep, and that's where the ozone comes in contact with the water. Uh, after, uh, after it goes in, it gets degassed, um, and that provides all the disinfection for our Tropical Reef exhibit. Now, some might say, well, what happens with the ozone, the extra ozone you don't use? Well, all the stuff that gets off-gassed um, goes into our ozone destruction unit. And these are on the roof, and they suck all the ozone off the top, all the extra ozone. And they put it through a hot bed of carbon, and that uh, kind of disperses the ozone into water and oxygen uh, into the atmosphere. We also have to worry about temperature control. You know, we need to make sure our animals are, I think, in tropical reefs specifically at 75 or 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, some might say, well, on, on cold days, we've got to make sure uh, we heat it up, or on hot days, we've got to make sure we cool it down, and that's very true. In our case, we use what we call a heat exchanger, and that's what this is here. It's about a suitcase size uh, piece of equipment. Uh, it doesn't look like much, but if you open it up, you can see here that inside are all titanium plates. Now this is the only metal that is touching the salt water and the entire aquarium system. Uh, titanium is used just particularly because it doesn't rust. Um, but you could see where the chilled water comes in from the building chillers, and then the, the, the water comes in from the uh, exhibit on the other side. And uh, there's a counter current heat exchange where the chilled water from the building is cooling down the water from tropical reef. Um, and when it gets to the right temperature, uh, the, the thermometer will read the right temperature, and then up here there's a little actuator that will turn off the valve from the chill water to make sure we're not overcooling the tank. But, uh, it's really amazing how such a small suitcase sized piece of equipment could keep 360,000 gallons at the right temperature at all times. Also, we have to worry about air. You know, in, in Nate's graphic earlier, it, you know, air stone was in there. We need to make sure there's plenty of air in the water for the animals to make it optimal for them, and we need to do the same thing here. Uh, just on a larger scale, these, are, uh, these two here in a pad are about the size of a, a whole car, and these are providing the air we need for, uh, for tropical reef. Um, also, we've got fans that are above the exhibit. These are really big fans that run 24 hours a day, uh, they remove all of the excess CO2 from the top of the water and, uh, and also provide a, provide a better atmosphere for the divers and everyone upstairs because it gets very, very humid upstairs. What did I do too? So what goes into taking care of Tropical Reef? There is a lot of equipment just for that tank. Uh, and here's our graphic for just that exhibit itself. Now we have one of these graphics for every single tank we have in the building, and this is by far our most, uh, it just, it's just our largest exhibit. Uh, here you can see the filters, uh, and we're able to monitor all of these things. We can turn off the pumps, we can turn on the pumps, and everything is alarmed. You see over here is in red. Uh, this means this is not within our normal parameters. Uh, if any things go into alarm, uh, we get a, a notification, uh, we get an alarm on our building computer and it sends a notification out to our technicians as well to make sure they fix the problem quickly. Um, besides just relying on a building computer, we also have our technicians, our life support technicians go around and they do rounds on all the equipment. Uh, they do rounds on all the equipment with a iPad and they're walking around looking at all of the levels, the oil levels, the temperatures, uh, the flows, 
and the amount of ozone in the exhibits, and they, uh, they upload it so we can trend it and keep an eye on it. They do that four times within 24 hours a day just to make sure everything is running optimally. So a lot goes into taking care of all this equipment. Uh, we have a life support team that does all of the work in-house. Um, there's nine of us, and there's seven technicians. There's a life support supervisor and myself. Uh, ultimately, we're monitoring everything 24 hours a day. We're maintaining all of the equipment. Uh, we're designing new stuff. Uh, there's lots of new exhibits coming. There's lots of uh, things that we think could be better, and we're trying to fix things and or, or, uh, or come up with new ideas. And so we're designing a lot. We're building almost every exhibit in-house, which is really, really great. Uh, gives the chance for all the life support technicians uh, to really learn a lot. We're constantly troubleshooting. Um, you know, ultimately, we've got over 15,000 different points that we need to look at on a daily basis. And that's a lot to take care of in case something goes wrong. Uh, I need to keep a tight list to make sure everything's all right all the time. Uh, the, one of the fun things on the life support team is we get to dive. We get to buff out the scratches on some of the uh, exhibit windows, which is really great. Or we need to do some maintenance or in some inspections as well or help out the uh, husbandry team if they need. And so many more things uh, that I can't even list that the life support team does. I, I really got to hand it to the technicians there. They're a really great team. One more thing we got to worry about is definitely the quality of our water. Now, we know we're doing all these great things to make sure it's great, but we need to test it to make sure it's great at all times. So these are some of the things that we're testing. And here's a picture of our water quality lab. I snuck in there when there was nobody in there, but it's always bustling. It's always busy. Water quality is one of the busiest uh, places to be. They're consistently sampling all the time. Uh, we're testing for temperature, salinity, pH, alkalinity, ammonia, nitrates, nitrites, bacteria, phosphates, dissolved oxygen, and probably a few more things uh, and on, a consistent, on a consistent basis to make sure everything's OK. They send out these reports on a, on a regular basis, and then the life support team can, uh, can take action to change some of these parameters if they're out of uh, our set point. Now what happens if the pumps turn off? Well, we can have that. These, uh, the system needs to run 24 hours a day. We need to make sure that stays like that. Uh, but there are instances where the power goes off, uh, whether it's a city problem or there's some other issue. If the power turns off, we have an emergency generator on site. And that's what's in this big box here. It's a big diesel emergency generator. It runs off of diesel fuel. It provides one megawatt of power. And that's not enough to provide power for the entire aquarium, but it is power enough to provide for all the critical instrumentation, the critical uh, equipment, um, and uh, just to keep things going until we can uh, get power back on. Um, it's maintained all the time by the facilities department. They test it on a regular basis. Uh, it's heated. It actually has heaters inside of it, so it's all warmed up and ready to go. So when we hit the start button, it starts up every time, uh, and we test it on a regular basis. So that was a little bit about the life support system. Uh, here's some of the fun facts I came up with, and yes, that is a fitting on one of our technicians' heads. Um, we're doing about 30,000 gallons a week on Tropical Reef, which means we switch out about 30,000 gallons of the water that's in the tank with the new water that's coming in. Um, some of that water we can recover. We don't just send it all down the drain. We can put it to our backwash recovery tanks, and then from there we can move, we can clean it up, and then we can move it uh, to other systems that might need that water. Um, we have uh, four people on the life support diving team, and we're consistently doing diving. We're looking forward to uh, helping the uh, helping the husbandry staff uh, drill some more holes and put in some more uh, corals in, in the Tropical Reef exhibit. Uh, like I said, uh, we, we monitor the parameters on, on Tropical Reef. And Tropical Reef has 57 parameters that the, that the building computer monitors alone, whether it's filter flows, if the pumps are on or off, the ozone levels, the level of the tanks, uh, all of that stuff goes into it. And uh, just 57 points are just monitored 24 hours a day just for Tropical Reef alone. Uh, we have seven technicians that are here for 24 hours a day monitoring uh, Tropical Reef. And then uh, we're doing rounds on it four times a day. Uh, and one fun fact about uh, life support, which I find really intriguing, is that we keep an eye on every gallon of water that comes in and out of the building. We're responsible for every gallon that comes in, and we're responsible for reporting every gallon that goes out. Tropical Reef is a really big portion of that because it's our largest exhibit. So uh, 
So it's a uh, it's challenging, but it's a uh, it's a great and rewarding rewarding job. And uh, I'm gonna, so I'm going to hand it off now to uh, Grady Scallon. He's our dive safety officer. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chris. That was very interesting. Uh, my name is Grady Scallon. I'm a dive safety officer here here at the aquarium. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview of our dive program. We have the most active dive program of any aquarium within the United States. In fact, for the last nine years running, we've averaged over 19,000 dives on an annual basis. That's a whole bunch of time that we spend in the water. So, who are we? Our dive program is made up mainly of volunteer divers, and they're some of the most dedicated, passionate people that you'll ever meet. In fact, the number one diver that was brought on to the aquarium before this facility was even open is still here today. She's been here for over 22 years. I think that shows quite a bit of dedication. In fact, we have at least four, mother, four other people that I know of that have been here in excess of 20 years. So once they come here, they usually stay, stick around for quite a while. Now our volunteer divers are pretty much a support group for our husbandry department. In fact, they're the lifeblood of the underwater work that happens in Trop Reef. It would really be a daunting task for the aquarist department to have to do all of the animal feeds and all of the maintenance that goes into keeping Trop Reef up and functioning. And to do this and to make sure that they're safe, the aquarium actually will provide all of the gear that's necessary for the divers to dive. Everything from wetsuits and fins to masks and regulators and BCDs. So what does it take to be a diver here at the aquarium? Well, to be considered to be a diver here, you have to meet several requirements. First, you have to be at least 18 years of age. You have to hold a rescue certification in diving, which is the third level of uh, certification up. You have to be current in CPR, basic first aid, and AED. You also have to be current in emergency O2 administration. So once you get do all that and you fill out the application, then you come in for an evening and we introduce the program. You take a written test. And then we schedule you for some more checkouts. You have to pass a swim checkout. You have to pass a scuba checkout. Then you have to pass a dive physical. And actually, that's just getting into the program. And now once you're at that point, that's really where all the training begins. All of our volunteers will go through a minimum of 60 hours of training, both above and below the surface. They're also required to go through a, an additional safety class and do a safety drill every year so that they can make sure that their skills are up to speed. In 2019, the divers did over 8,650 working dives in Trop Reef alone. So you can imagine that's quite a bit of time. Actually, it totaled up to 211,214 minutes or just over 3,500 hours of work underwater in that one exhibit. So what do we do? We do a lot of maintaining exhibit health. We do this by cleaning. You can see from the slides up there that we use our HydroVac systems. The slide on the upper right, that gentleman is using a power scrubber. On the bottom left, you'll see somebody doing windows. We do lots and lots and lots of windows here. And on, on the bottom right, you can actually see somebody using good old elbow grease and a hand scrubbing brush. That happens on a daily basis. So what else do we do here? We feed the animals. This is a short clip showing a typical dive in Trop Reef. It's kind of sped up and crop down, but you'll see the first diver will actually be doing what we call a large scatter, where you're feeding the medium-sized fish and the real aggressive fish that call Trop Reef their home. Um, they need to be occupied so that the other divers in the exhibit 
can do what we're calling target feeding and uh, they just need to be occupied for about 15 minutes so the other feeds can take place. The next diver you'll see down on the bottom is going to do a target feed of that very large fish coming right to her. She's going to give that fish another little piece of fish. How would you like to give that a try? The other type of feeding that we do actually shows our guests up on the window how the animals actually eat. You can see that diver there very patiently waiting for the right animal to come up. He's actually going to be feeding the mangrove ray, so he's looking around and he's looking around and he finally spots the mangrove on the bottom. The mangrove comes up the window, the diver moves into position and gets the animal a piece of food. The audience can actually see the animal moving the food around until it gets it into its mouth. And then the diver will go in and give him another piece of food. And they'll do this, actually it takes about 15 minutes for the whole thing to take place. A lot of what we do also is we engage the public through presentations. Uh, we have special masks that are created so that the diver can speak with the dry side presentation or dry side presenter. They actually have just an ongoing conversation. They get to talk about some of the animals around in the exhibit. They also get to talk about the mission of the aquarium as a whole. And then while we're up in the dive locker, we're a point on the behind the scenes tour where the divers get the opportunity to talk to our guests as they come through the dive locker. One of our most important jobs that we have as divers is we get to observe the animals. We're in there every day and we're trained on the, how the animals act and react. And just like your pet at home, if they don't feel right, they don't act right. So you notice on the bottom left, there's a picture of a spade fish swimming back and forth between the bubbles. Actually, that fish's nickname is Bubbles. And during every presentation that we give, that fish will be swimming back and forth through the diver's bubbles. Now, if that fish isn't there for one or two or maybe three dives in a row, that tells us that there might be something wrong. So we let the aquarist know and we let our vet staff know that, hey, in this particular exhibit, this particular type of fish may be something that you guys need to uh, take a look at. So, why do we do this? Some people think we're a little nuts, um, but actually all the divers, they just love diving, they love the ocean, and this gives them an opportunity to give back to their community something that they're really passionate about, something that they really, really like to do. And we also do it for the public, to engage the kids, to put that sense of wonder back into our eye. And sometimes it's just for fun. You never know what a kid's going to do on the other side of the window. So who can do this? Just about anybody. You do have to meet the requirements that I brought up earlier. Uh, we are always looking for experienced divers. We need to make sure that everybody is very experienced, very comfortable in the water, because you're going into the fish's home. We're just there once a week or so on a you know short time, so we need to make sure that the fish are safe while you're in their home with them. So if you'd like to, please go to the aquarium website. You can go to the volunteer page, and you can check out to see when the uh, sign-up periods are available. And if this is something that you might like to do, uh, please contact us. Thank you. From here, I'll turn it over to Lauren. Uh, thanks, Grady. Uh, my name is Lauren, and I'm the aquarist in charge of Tropical Reef. And I'm going to be talking about what it takes to keep this exhibit clean for our animals and looking beautiful for our guests. Now, Tropical Reef is the largest exhibit at the aquarium, so it takes a lot of work to keep it clean. We utilize our volunteer divers as well as staff to perform maintenance on this exhibit. We have an entire team of staff, that, staff, staff divers dedicated to cleaning this exhibit. Uh, each team is assigned to a section of Tropical Reef and it's their responsibility to clean their section weekly. So let's talk about why we need to perform maintenance in the first place. Uh, there's two reasons I'm gonna focus on in this uh, lecture and those are animal health and aesthetics. 
In regards to animal health, it's important to keep the sand clean in this exhibit for water quality, but also for health related issues. We have a lot of animals that rest on the sand for large portions of their day in Tropical Reef. So it's really important that we keep that sand clean. Any fish waste or uneaten food that's not sucked out by filtration ends up on the sand. So we have to reg regularly clean that sand. If we didn't, it could lead to parasite outbreaks or bacterial growth. Uh, we use a, a tool called Hydrovac to do this. If you have a home aquarium, you probably have a small gravel washer uh, to clean your sand. Our Hydrovac is just a tiny bit bigger. Uh, it's actually powered by a worn one horsepower pump and the way that it works is that pump is sucking the water uh, up and out of the tank. And when you put the tube on the sand, uh, it's gonna suck out all of that detritus that we're trying to get out. And you can actually see it coming off in this video, um, but it's, the suction isn't powerful enough to suck the sand out. So then the sand settles back down in the exhibit. Uh, personally, this is one of my favorite maintenance dives to do. Uh, it's really satisfying to see all of that gross stuff being sucked out of the exhibit. And not only does this improve water quality, but it's essential to the health of our animals. Now, the main thing that we clean in Tropical Reef is algae off of rocks and windows. Uh, algae grows naturally in our exhibits, but it grows really fast in Tropical Reef. And that's because we have a lot of lights above this exhibit. We have 20 metal halides, six LEDs, and two giant skylights. So this exhibit gets a lot of light which means a lot of algae growth. So if we didn't scrub that algae away, the entire rock work and all of the corals would just be covered in brown algae. And if we didn't wipe the windows, you wouldn't even be able to see into the exhibit. The windows on Tropical Reef get hit almost every day and it takes over an hour to clean all of these windows. So it's a huge part of daily maintenance. Now to clean the algae off of the rock work, we use scrub brushes. And while we do hand scrub regularly in this exhibit, it's not the most efficient method for such a large uh, exhibit. Hand scrubbing takes a lot of time and you can only cover a small amount of area on one scuba tank of air. And we actually have some algae in this exhibit that will not come off with hand scrubbing. So we use something a little bit more powerful. We use a motor powered scrubber called a Meridian. And these scrub brushes are hooked up to pressure washers uh, that create the energy needed to power them. And these are not light tools. Uh, they're pretty heavy and they're also pretty difficult to control. Uh, they have a mind of their own. So if you're not strong enough to control them, you can actually be drug all over the exhibit by one. And the brush head spins so quickly that it creates a force that suctions you onto the rock work. So all of your energy isn't put into holding it up, but just controlling where it goes. Um, it's a great arm and ab workout. And oftentimes divers will fight over who gets to use it because they want that workout and other people avoid it like the plague. Now, in addition to the rock work, we also have to clean the corals. All of the corals in Tropical Reef are artificial, so algae grows all over them. We have thousands of artificial corals in Tropical Reef, and we are constantly swapping them out to keep the exhibit looking beautiful. There are so many corals in here that hand scrubbing alone is not really an option for us. So we remove the corals and we bleach them to kill the algae. Um, and once these uh, corals are removed, and bleach, we'll put them back into the, the exhibit. Um, now each coral has a peg at the base and we use this to put into holes that are drilled into the rock work throughout the exhibit and that's what anchors them into place. So once these corals are removed, they, the, those holes magically fill up with sand. And the culprit behind that is the adorable cow nose ray. This guy will swim around the exhibit. He goes down onto the bottom, sucks a bunch of sand up into his mouth, and then he just sprinkles it everywhere. And inevitably, it ends up in those holes. So before we replace the corals, we actually have to remove the sand out of each hole. We use a small, small pony bottle with an air gun attachment that we place into each individual hole to blow the sand out. 
This process can be really time consuming and there are corals that we that need to be removed and replaced weekly. So we get a lot of help from our volunteer divers with this task. And this is just a snapshot of the maintenance that happens in Tropical Reef. This is a 20 year old exhibit. So we are constantly repairing and replacing components in Tropical Reef. Essentially the work is never done. But we're really lucky to have our volunteer and staff divers to help us out with this maintenance. We appreciate them so much for all of the hard work that they put into this single exhibit. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Janet, who is going to talk more about our artificial corals. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Well, again, my name is Janet Monday, and I'm the assistant curator of Fish and Invertebrates. And Lauren just talked about cleaning the exhibit. But in addition to cleaning the exhibit and the corals like Lauren talked about, we like to decorate the reef to try to create the most naturalistic environment for our fish. The Trop Reef exhibit is 100% artificial coral, unlike many of our other exhibits, which are live coral. Without refurbishing or replacing corals, the coral and rock work begin to look the same color like you see here. And a way to improve that is by adding the brightly colored artificial corals. We try to clean or switch out the corals for every area in the exhibit once a week, which means changing out literally hundreds of corals a week. As the corals get dirty and start to turn brown, they're scrubbed, as Angelina is doing in this video, or they are removed, bleached, rinsed, and then placed back into the rock work. To add more corals, we have to drill holes into the concrete. That's underwater something that I'm sure home hobbyists probably don't have to worry about. Luckily, we have this tool to help, which is an underwater pneumatic hammer drill that we hook up to an air compressor. So here's an example of three different coral sizes that could be added into the exhibit. We have a large vase sponge at the top, a brain sponge, and a sun coral. And you can see the post sizes on the left-hand side there. They're all different sizes. And so they need a different size drill bit so that we can drill it into the rock work. So this is a video of Adam drilling some holes into the concrete. We we're able to drill about 20 holes per dive before having to switch to scuba, our scuba tanks. These dives take careful planning because we have to decide where we'd like to drill a colony of corals or sponges and then make sure that we have these corals available to be added to the exhibit. In addition to adding corals, we can improve the look of corals that we already have in rotation. Over time, these corals get normal wear and tear. They can have sun damage or have breaking, like if you see in the top left-hand picture, the coral on the right has been bleached and you can see it's broken. Or they can also have algae and other organisms growing on them like the white spots you see in the bottom right picture on that coral. One of our former aquarists, Jessica Nishimoto, took the idea of painting corals and ran with it. She had some great artistic skills and was passionate about improving the look of the corals that have faded. You can see this first fan gorgonian coral is the original one on the left-hand side, and she painted two different colors, the orange and the purple that you see. And then the same in the bottom picture, she painted the two vase sponges on the right-hand side and the originals on the left. There's a lot of prep work involved in this process, including cleaning the dirty, the dirty corals, priming, painting, epoxying, going through the trial and error of what products will stay on the corals in the water. And of course, all the products we use are 100% safe for all of our animals. And because this painting process is so labor intensive, we had to get the help from everyone using their artistic ability to paint these corals, including some of our more artistic volunteers. The most rewarding thing we noticed when adding these corals to the tank is how the animals seem to be drawn to the bright colors when we first add new or refurbished corals to the exhibit. So next, um, to set up this next video clip that Jessica Nishimoto made, it shows the process of painting corals. You can see that she takes care to make sure the corals look as naturalistic as possible when she's painting. We're always working to refine our methods to improve the decor for our animals.
So I'll leave you with this video here. Okay, thank you, Janet. That was wonderful. And thanks uh, to the rest of the panel as well. This is a great summary of how a mega aquarium works. And hopefully, we, give you, we gave you a glimpse of how it operates. It takes a lot of hard work, sweat, and tears to create the serene, tranquil environment that we all enjoy. I was so glad that we were given the opportunity to do this two-part series on, uh, on our operations and, and what goes into the work, the hard work that everybody does. I, I think these are all things that we often take for granted since we do them day in and day out, but we're really happy to share them all with you today. I also want to thank all the people who contribute to Tropical Reef and all the exhibits at the Aquarium in the Pacific. Um, many people do a lot of different jobs, as you can see. Everybody does a, a specialty task that and it all comes together for the final product. Uh, I'd be remiss without mentioning our volunteer staff. Uh, our paid staff at Aquarium of the Pacific are outnumbered over three to one by volunteers in normal circumstances. Uh, and we could, definitely couldn't do it with all the, without all the passion and dedication of these volunteers. I'd also want to thank all the volunteers who are staying home uh, during uh, a lot of the COVID stuff. We were only able to bring back a, a certain amount of people, and uh, I know that a lot of other people would have liked to have been here to contribute, and then we hope to get to back to that point in the near future. So I've asked the panel to come and join me up here on stage, and we're going to do a little bit of a question and answer in the absence of a live audience. So without further ado... All right. Well, thanks everyone again for your contributions. Um, Chris, why don't I start with you? I know that we often get um, the question, uh, since we're a coastal aquarium, if we're just circulating ocean water and running it back out, I know you went through a lot of detail there. Maybe tell us, uh, tell us, are we doing that? And if we aren't, why? And expand on that. Yeah, thanks, Nate. I'd be happy to answer that question for you. Um, Tropical Reef, uh, just like every other uh, aquarium system at Aquarium of the Pacific, is called a closed system, which means it has its own water, its own pumps, and all its own equipment. Uh, there, We do not have just one uh, big pipe that sends water from the ocean to all the exhibits and then, and then back out to the ocean again. 
Um, this way uh, we can maintain the water the way we want, uh, the temperature we want, uh, the water quality that we want, and uh, it works out really well uh, to have a closed system. So uh, all of the water in Tropical Reef is all recirculated upon itself. Uh, the water that comes in through the seawater intake pumps and through the deliveries that we get, uh, that goes into our main reservoirs in the building. Uh, those reservoirs uh, recirculate on itself uh, 24 hours a day to make sure it's all nice and clean. And then we have saltwater makeup pumps that pump that reservoir water th around the entire building on one big loop. So all you have to do to fill a tank when you're done removing water from the tank is go up to the top, open the valve, and that water from the saltwater makeup system from the reservoir uh, comes straight into your exhibit. Uh, it's really convenient and it's great for uh, quarantine and it's great for the animals and the environment. Okay, um, for those of you who are familiar with our geography, we are located right near the mouth of the LA River. Uh, does that contribute to the reason that we don't use raw ocean water in our exhibits? And, and you talked about our intake pipe. Can you share where that's located and, and what we do to mitigate any potential contaminants? Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Nate. Yeah, we get uh, water from the seawater intake uh, pump, and we are at the base of the Los Angeles River. Um, so, of course, the water quality can be dynamic at times. Uh, so we make sure that we pump uh, only at high tide. Uh, we don't pump five days after rain, because uh, sometimes we're seeing contaminants in, in the water that we have trouble uh, getting out. Uh, and then it's based on our, our ability to clean that water up, to move it into our reservoirs. And we have to do that in batches. So we take that water in uh, three times a week. Uh, we pump about, gosh, I think it's about 60,000 gallons three times a week. We clean that water up within about a day. Uh, it's easily within the parameters that we need to move into our reservoir water. And we can use, we pump that water into our reservoirs and use it that way. Uh, there's a big screen on top of that seawater intake pump that makes we make sure that we don't uh, take in any animals or harm any animals uh, with the taking in of our water during those those in those events so yeah that's a it's a great process yeah that sounds really interesting uh grady moving on to some of the the dive stuff that you share is really fascinating it looks like our volunteers really enjoy being parts of those dive teams um we often get a question i know that that i've got it so you must have gotten it too do the Divers, can they see the people on the other side of the window? Uh, that's a good question. And actually, the answer is yes. We can see out just as well as the guests can see in, which um, really helps us engage uh, with the public. You can go right up to the window at an end of a dive, and you might be doing rock, paper, scissors with a little kid, um, which is actually a whole lot of fun to do. But yes, we can definitely see out just as well as everybody else can see us. Cool, you gotta be really uh, hip to all the, the new high fives and fist bumps and everything, right? Oh, it is, it's great. Um, that's what a lot of the divers really look forward to at the end of the, at the, end of the dive, is uh, really getting as close as you can to the public without and still being in the water. Right. And what a great interface to be able to see the guest reaction to both the diver and the animals and uh, really just kind of experience why why we do this right yeah it's um to see the wonder in the kids eyes um it's it's an amazing thing to see right that's great uh janet i was looking at that uh meridian power scrubber and that looks like quite a tool uh do you use that regularly in the exhibits uh yeah i do um i have to admit if i haven't used it for a period of time i am sore right after using it because it's such a heavy piece of equipment and to bring it up and keep it up for the full hour and then constantly steer that thing around. Um, it's definitely a really good workout. <laughs> and it's also very satisfying because you get to see all the algae that you're cleaning off too. So it's a, a very satisfying dive. Right. And when the alternative is a, a toothbrush, it's probably <laughs> pretty gratifying to have such a piece of machinery. Yeah. Yeah. That would remind me of cutting grass with scissors. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. And uh, tell me more about the coral, the artificial coral. Uh, some of it looks pretty realistic. Uh, are, are they fictitious? Are they made up corals or in a lab or are they modeled after natural coral? Yeah. So um, the corals that we have purchased throughout our 20 year history have um, come from a company that fabricates corals and we can actually pick out exactly what species of corals we want. 
um, which is really fun to go through the exhibit. And if you want to add a whole colony of vase corals or some sponges to a certain area, you can go and pick out those exact species and order those. And then as they fade over time, we'll look on the internet and find the places that, um, you know, from previous dives of colors of these vibrant colors. And then we want to recreate those with the spray paint so that we can create the most naturalistic environment with these artificial corals. That's great. Um, I, I think that the inner workings that, that you all shared tonight uh, are just kind of mind boggling, even though I see them every day. So um, it, particularly, Chris, when you were saying that 15,000 gallons per minute, I was trying to think as you were talking about that, is there a metric of comparison that kind of puts that in perspective? Like, I mean, a, 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 a personal swimming pool must be something between like eight and 10,000 gallons. So it'd be the equivalent of nearly draining two per minute with that amount of water. Yeah, when you think about, when you think about it in that perspective, it, yeah, I think that's one of the only ways you can really think about that amount of water is something like a large swimming pool. Um, and just uh, turn your watch on and watch 60 seconds go by and all of a sudden your pool is empty. And that's, that's in one minute, uh, 24 hours a day for that exhibit. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really great. I think it's, it's, it's really what it needs to make sure that the, the water quality is optimal for the animals. Well, that's just wonderful. So yeah, I can't say enough thank yous for, for all the hard work that you guys do and for contributing to this presentation. And hopefully everyone at home was able to learn a little bit about how we operate. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for walking, watching at home. Um, this video presentation will be archived at AquariumThePacific.org and streamed on Aquarium's YouTube page. Uh, please be sure to join us for the next virtual lecture on October 8th when Hazel Wong from the Nature Conservancy will be here to discuss the voting patterns of communities of color versus white communities when it comes to environmental issues. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you.